for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello everyone and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club, a podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. My name is Ben Wright and I will be joined as usual by Michael Vaughan and Phil Tufnell. But today they're dialing in from their holidays. Back in the UK, England struggles with the white ball are unfortunately continuing. Joss Butler's side suffered a serious defeat to India over the weekend and was soundly beaten by South Africa on Tuesday. To make matters worse, there was a surprise announcement from Ben Stokes on Monday that Tuesday's ODI would be his last as an England player. The test captain said that he could no longer give 100% in all three formats and said the relentless schedule many cricketers have to endure was too much. We'll get stuck into Stokes' retirement and the wider implications it could have for the game. We'll also get the thoughts of former India head coach Ravi Shastri, who called up with Mike to express his own concerns about the calendar. Our guest today is the Sultan of Swing and the King of the Yorker, former Pakistan fast bowler Wazim Akram, who will be talking about his amazing career and giving us his take on the current state of the game. And we'll be getting the reaction of the guys to a thrilling finish in the Vitality Blast Fight. Mike and Phil, hello. How are you? You've you've escaped from the extreme heat here in the UK. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Santorini at the moment, having a lovely time, having a couple of days break, uh, enjoying the sunshine. And and it's not as hot as where you are, but it's pretty hot. (laughs) There's a lovely breeze. There's a lovely breeze, just that wonderful breeze just coming off the ocean. (laughs) Yeah, I'm in France, back on Thursday, uh, near the vineyards, a few few great testing (laughs) testing sessions as you do. I'm lucky you've had one of mine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's very nice, very nice. It's probably cooler than the UK so it's lovely yeah so what's the temperature there 30 yeah yeah you yeah about 31 32 Okay, it was thirty-eight here yesterday. Wow, well, absolutely. Sorry. I heard, I heard Luton, I heard Luton airports melted. Yeah, the the, the runway <laughs> melted. They they cancelled all of the planes. And the, well, well, uh, there's uh, an RAF base where the where the uh, runway is melted as well. So wow. just I hope that Putin wow. doesn't notice. <laughs> I have a subtle plan. <laughs> well, I did, I, I did see. Uh, I, I, I saw the the one day game in Durham, uh, and there was a there was a whisper in a room that it might get called yeah. off for the heat. Durham, the heat. But I did notice also on the on the on the uh, on the camera that um, the the queues for the beers seem to be rather large at the ground. <laughs> they seem to be queuing around the block to get a bit of lager yes. to cool them down. I don't think that's rehydration, Mike, is it, Lager? It yeah, feels well, like it at the time, but I think it, it takes it all. Well, in, in fairness, they were queuing for the water and the Mr Whippies as well. There were big queues there as well. Oh, I bet he made a few quid, Mr Whippy, yesterday. Oh, you've got to be quick to eat then, though. <laughs> yeah, you need to eat that eat that quick. <laughs> you've got to have good lick action. <laughs> good technique. You got to have good technique. It's going down your shirt, isn't it? It did look. It, it, it didn't look. It, it looked a bit of a lackluster game as well. I think everyone was feeling the heat a bit, but it just didn't sort of kick off, did it? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. First, though, clearly the biggest news of the week is Ben Stokes having yeah. retired from One Day Cricket. Uh, so he won't be there next year to defend the World Cup title. He's so instrumental mm-hmm. in helping England win in in 2019. Um, but it's not really just about one guy and his sore knees. It's really a sort of warning sign for the state of the game, isn't it? Yeah, um, it is. It's also a realisation of where the game's at. Uh, when you think that the next 50 over World Cup, England are the world champions, uh, is only, what, 14, 15 months away. For Ben Stokes to have retired with 15 months to go to the next yeah. World Cup is, is you know, I, I just look at him at 31 years of age, and think, yeah, his body's not been great. Um, he plays so much cricket. I think Phil said on a, a WhatsApp call to me, I think I'm going to play 29 days out of 47, which is just stupid. It, it is stupid. And, yeah. you know, the administration uh, of the game for a long time has been uh, questionable. And I think those that get the nice checks, uh, sell the TV deals, uh, are not kind of doing the service of what the players require. And once all these T20 leagues took off, and once they started to want their own windows, which it's, it's fine, not a problem, um, you then can't have bilateral 50 over T20 series against all the teams. You know, they all say they want to save test match cricket. You know, I think yeah. 
we're now getting into a situation where it is a clear possibility that the 50 over game is coming to an end. The 50 over game, a game that I, I've loved watching oh, for many, really? many years. Yeah. Well, it has to be under consideration because you've got test cricket that all the players still seem to favour, which is great. Love it. Um, and then the T20 uh, yeah. format, and then all these T20 leagues. South Africa have now got one in January. You've got the Big Bash, you've got the Pakistan Super League, Sri Lanka, the 100, the Vitality Blast, Caribbean Super League. Um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's UAE leagues that have been considered as well. There's too many leagues. And, you know, for all these major countries to want their own leagues to be prominent and successful, it's impossible to play bilateral series as well as have your own league, as well as play test match cricket. So I, I think Ben will have done, um, you know, something very good for the for the players in the game. Almost send a, a message to the administrators: enough's enough. He said the three formats are just unsustainable for me now. Not only do I feel that my body is letting me down because of the schedule and what is expected of us, but I also feel that I am taking the place of another player who can give Joss and the rest of the team their all. So the emphasis on the word unsustainable and the phrase, the schedule, and what is expected of us. And speaking to the media ahead of Tuesday's match, he was even more strident. He said, we are not cars. You can't just fill us up and we'll go out there and be ready to be fueled up again. So it really feels like Stokes is using his platform to send a very public message to the sports administrators. Well, yes, I, I think it's I think it's a huge warning to the, to the administrators, and they've got to take heed of it. There just aren't enough days in 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 the week, in the summer, in the season, in the year to to cram all of this in, and and, and something's going to have to go. And if if people want to see. Uh, the the best quality cricket. If they want to see the best players, you know, which obviously everyone wants to do, they've got to come up with a solution and fast because otherwise people are just going to start falling by the wayside. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it intrigues me with with how these you know because cricket is run on television deals. That that's where money for the game comes from. It's 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 the the CEOs of all these major countries going to all the different broadcasters, putting together a, a window of um, cricket, and that's what they're buying. You know, once players like Ben Stokes pull out, you know, what, what's going to happen in, in the future of TV deals? Because, you know, if a player pulls out, and but let's be honest, Ben Stokes is a big card for the fans. You know, you want to go and watch Ben Stokes. And it's amazing that they've not been able to just manage his schedule for at least the next 15 months to that next 50 over World Cup in India to get him through that, and then he disappears. To think that he's done it so soon to the next World Cup, I know there's a T20 World Cup in a few months' time, but yes, there's the Ashes, he's a captain of the Test team, he's done fantastic with that. But to think that they've not been able to say to him, look, over the next 15 months, this is going to be your schedule, this is where we're going to play you, and this is the kind of rest you're going to have as well. You've also got to bear in mind that the IPL for these players is huge, and Ben missed this year's IPL, they decided to rest. But I'm sure in time, you know, he's going to play T20 cricket. He's going to get a massive IPL deal. And players deserve that. You know, there'll be so many people out there go, oh, you know, they've got to play for their country. But when you're getting potentially uh, one, two, three million pounds to go and play in a, an eight-week window, and, and even if you only play half of that window, you're going to get a huge amount of money. I don't think y you can stop players from doing that. Um, I'm intrigued. I think the Future Tours program, the next one goes till around 2027. Uh, in that, there's a, a three-week window in the heart of England summer for the 100. So the ECB are making sure that their prominent tournament is going to get a lot of profile and exposure. The IPL is growing and growing. So there's about a two-and-a-half-month window for the IPL. There's the South Africa T20 League. South Africa have just pulled out of playing one-day cricket and T20 cricket in Australia in January. So all their players can play in their own league. That is the early indication for me that bilateral T20s 50 over cricket is going to have to stop and you're going to have to pick your players from all these leagues around if all these countries want their prominent leagues to stand out and have profile you can't have the bilateral series as well I honestly think we're getting very very close to the game making a decision is 50 over cricket viable now it was 15 years ago it was probably six or seven years ago is it still viable? Isn't it better that we have Test cricket, four-day cricket, which is sitting to the left, and then T20 cricket, 100-ball cricket, sits to the, and it's just two different sports almost. In the middle, this 50-over stuff. I mean, Wazim Akram uh, is, is on the show, and, and he talks about the 50-over game being boring now, boring for players because it's so much longer than the 20-over game. And when you've got legends like Wazim Akram speaking out, 
I honestly think there's a, a viable chance now yeah. that in our lifetime, and it might be very, very soon, next year's World Cup, and maybe the one after in terms of 50 overs may happen. I'm not too sure we'll have many more 50 over World Cups. I mean, my, my day job's writing about um, business and economics and international cricket is a, is a luxury good. And if you are in charge of a luxury good, the most important thing is scarcity value. You know, I see you're, you've got a you've got a nice Rolex watch, Mike. Uh, if you go if you go into a Rolex outlet and ask to buy a watch, they'll say, "Sorry, we haven't got any," and you get put on a waiting list. And maybe they contact you in a couple of months' time. Lawrence Stroll, when he took over Aston Martin, the first thing he did was reduce the number of cars that they were producing. If you if you just flood the market with your luxury good, it's no longer a luxury good, and people won't pay to go and go and watch it. Um, and, and maybe we saw a little bit of that in the uh, the match against South Africa, as you said. Um, was it Macron saying that the game is boring? The game this week was a little bit boring. Yeah. What What about though? What, what about all the history though? I mean, we are the World Cup holders. Yes. Let's, let's not get rid of the one thing that we are actually holding on to. I know. You know, it's, also, it's how I got into the game. The first, I think I've told you, uh, Phil, the first game I ever went to watch was uh, Middlesex in the NatWest final in 1988. Yes. You were 12th man, I believe. Yeah, totally. um, <laughs> and that's that's where my love of the game. And, but the, but those those one day domestic final competitions, the NatWest and the Benson and Hedges, you know, they've, be, they've clearly been devalued. Yeah. Yeah, mm. as you say, if you have steak and chips every day of the week, you, you start not fancying steak and chips, don't you? It's as simple as that. There has been a flood. There's, there's just too much cricket, and it's been talked about for a long time now, hasn't it? That there's just too much. To, even the players don't know what clothes to pack in the morning nowadays. You know, are they putting on their, their you know, the fifty overs, the Trent rockets? Are they putting on their whites? What are they doing? You know what I mean? They, and it's just diluting it. And I felt that you're right. I felt that that England South Africa game. At, um, at at Chesterley Street yesterday was just diluted. It didn't feel no, it, nobody cared. Nobody cared, did they or not? I don't know. No, no I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's a great day out. The fans still enjoy it because it was a, a big crowd and, and Durham don't get much cricket, so yeah. it's great for them. It was a bit hot, but you just look at the last few weeks of the schedule where England have been against India. You know, they play the test match at Edgebaston. It was only a sh- a few days after they started the T20 series, that went around the country. And then this last week, they played uh, India at the Oval. They played India at um, at Lords. Then they go to Old Trafford. And then two days later, they're playing South Africa in Durham. Then a few days later, they're playing back at Old Trafford. Then they go to Henley on the Sunday. And then Tuesday next week, they're playing in Bristol. I mean, they're like, um, you know, I always say in one day <laughs> cricket, you're like on tour as a rock it's band. Aren't you? It's got, you're, you're going from a you're, <laughs> You are, that's all you are. You're just turning up. It's like, okay, you just pr- produce your kind of set. What's your set? Oh, I sing a couple of songs. You sing a couple of songs. And there you go. You do a little bit at the end. That's it. And you just get on to the next road show. Um, it's not what international cricket is. And, and, and you're right, Phil. When when a series becomes so, oh, there's another game on. Uh, uh, what was the score? You don't really, really take much note of it. That, for me, is when the administrators need to take note even more and go, actually, are these series important? Not really. Would it have been better for the players to have a bit of a breather at this stage or a little bit of a time away or go and play a bit of their own domestic cricket? Possibly that would be the way to go. And that's why I'm with Ravi Shastri, uh, who, who actually says bilateral one-day cricket, T20 cricket, um, I think in the future with Ravi, they're the ones that will need to go if they want to have all these leagues around the world. Have a listen to what Ravi has to say, Phil. I think uh, the uh, main main issue would be uh, I I would say is uh, balancing it uh, balancing everything out. You know I would I would be a little careful of the number of bilateral splits, especially in T Twenty cricket. I would rather go the football way. You know where uh, there's a lot of franchise cricket which can be encouraged, whichever country it's in, whether it's in India, whether it's in West Indies, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it is. Uh, Anyway, you know, it, it, it can be encouraged and uh, you play less bilaterals and then you get together for the World Cups so that the emphasis on World ICC World Cup events becomes paramount. You know, then people look forward to it, wait for it. Meanwhile, T20 cricket can be played, you know, like franchise cricket so that there's more time then to play bilateral test cricket amongst the top six sides. I think two tiers are needed. Otherwise, Test cricket will die in 10 years' time. 
you need two tiers, six teams at the top, you know, maximum six teams at the top and then six teams in the second uh, second group and then you qualify. And those top six play against each other more often because of the corridor you've opened up for less bilateral T20 cricket and just franchise cricket. And that's, that's the way all formats of the game can survive. In the middle, you have a 50-over tournament as well. So, you know, every four years you play that 50-over World Cup. Every two years you can play the T20 World Cup and, you know, spread it across different countries and keep Test cricket as your main card. Yeah, do, do, do you have any concern? I mean, South Africa have just pulled out the one days in, in Australia. Uh, to come there you to go. You know, th that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, that's exactly. So, what they're saying literally is what I've been telling you now is they're saying, listen, there's too much bilateral cricket. We don't want that bilateral cricket. We want, uh, you know, emphasis on domestic competition because it's the bucks. It's the bread and butter for our cricket to survive, you know, and, uh, you know, keep it going. So we need that uh, we we need that income to you know keep the game going, uh, and you play less bilateral cricket. So that's how I'm I'm not surprised with the way South Africa is thinking. I think a lot of countries will think in that fashion in the future. So Phil, what do you, what do you make of what Ravi said there? Well, if if Ravi Shastri is saying it, you know it's it's going to be coming, isn't it? It's going to be round the corner. He's got his finger on the pulse of international cricket for me, and uh, yeah, it's it's a real warning and a worry. Yeah, and that was a that was a little nugget from uh, an interview that Mike did uh, this week, but we'll be playing later in the season. The guest this week uh, is Ravi Makram, <laughs> the Sultan of Swing and the King of the Yorker. For me, one of the best that's ever played the game. What do you reckon, Phil? Absolutely, as you say, the Sultan of Swing, great batsman as well, great leader of the the attack, bowled ninety mile an hour in swing and away, swing and away, nipping. Magnificent! What a bowler, an absolute legend of the game. Oh, you have a York I, you? I, he, he got me many times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I reckon if you're picking a World Eleven of all time, Wazim's in it. I reckon you're getting Wazim Akram in oh, it without any question. Uh, left arm rockets, round the wicket, over the wicket, bounces Yorkers, slow balls. Uh, phew, could whack massive sixes, and, and 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 we ask him, don't we, about T20 cricket? I reckon Wazim Akram now, Phil. Going to the IPL auction, I, I, I can't imagine how much money he'd go for. I, I reckon three or four million quid and you've got a bargain. I, th I think I'm right in saying that he holds the, the record for the number of sixes in a, in a test innings. Still. Which Does he? Is yeah. Incredible. And hat-tricks, I think. So, okay, quiz question for you. Yeah. He has uh, four international hat-tricks. Yeah. Two in ODIs. Uh, and two in tests, and one other guy has has four hat tricks. Who's that? Dale Stein. No. Nope. Uh, Mur Murley. Oh. No. No. That's is a it a guy. Ah. Ah. Last good shot. Yeah, Yorkers. He got. He's got three in ODIs and one in uh, in a T twenty. Yeah. But Wazim, Wazim's test hat tricks. Yeah. came in successive games against Sri Lanka. <laughs> so he got a hat-trick one week, then he played them the next week, got another hat-trick. They must have been sick of the sight of him by the end That's of that. greedy. That's greedy, that is. That's greedy. <laughs> Delighted to say that our special guest for today is the Pakistani legend, Wazim Akram. Wazim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Waz, can you just tell us what you've just told us off air that you're moving your family out of your ha house in Altrincham because it's too too warm? <laughs> yeah, I came from Pakistan to to escape heat <laughs> for a month and a half. From last two nights, I mean, we couldn't sleep. These houses are not baked for hot weather. Yeah. It's like I'm sleeping in an oven. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're moving into a hotel for a couple of nights for for AC. Yes, for a couple of nights. <laughs> Booked a lorry hotel in Manchester. We're checking in today afternoon. Oh, you've, got, <laughs> uh, you've, got, you've got some nice thick shag pile carpet just to keep you nice and warm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, I've got a fan on and I'm sweating <laughs> inside my house. <laughs> I mean, I was telling my kids, I've been, I mean, I've, I've been coming to England since 32, 33 years and never seen anything like it before. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be 26 degrees and heat wave. And from last two days, a proper heat wave, 38 <laughs> degrees. 
Was can we can I just explain to you the the, the podcast? So this sure. is, it's called the Vaughny and and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast. Yes. So okay. uh, Jeremy is the producer. Ben is the serious uh, uh, journalistic um, presenter, and then you've got me and uh, Phil Tuffner, who's in Greece, and I'm in France. But we are a team, and we've been looking for a left arm opening bowler. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and Phil 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 got in touch with me so I think we want to go for the best. Yes. <laughs> Thank you boys. I mean it's a pleasure. I've heard about your Paul, uh, you know this this program and I think it's doing great. Congratulations all of you. Good. And you. yeah, I'm happy to be here and see good to see you guys. So was it yeah. can I start asking you did, did you prefer bowling with a new ball or the old ball? Uh, early on, definitely the old ball, semi-new ball. I mean, if you remember when I played for Lancashire first year, 1988, for some odd reason, my captain, David Hughes, great guy, helped me a lot early on in my days. He used to say, okay, you're going to come at number, uh, uh, you know, first change. So I got comfortable. And of course, if it's a hot day and if it's reversing of it, always helped. Yeah. So definitely early days, semi-new ball. But I think eventually I learned that how to bowl a new ball. So I was enjoying both. Uh, and Waz, where did you get all of those skills from? You were saying Lancashire like, and everything, but surely, you know, back home in Pakistan, those wickets and everything, you, 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 you know, no bounce, no grass. You have, you're, you're brought up on reverse swing, aren't you? Yes, we all, all of us did. So we learned reverse swing. Obviously, I came into Pakistan team when I was 17 years old. So I didn't know, it was, my fourth first class game was a test match. <laughs> So I learned while I came into Pakistan, Imran taught me, Imran took me under his wing. So it took me about a couple of months. But people like Makar, Yunus, Akib Javed, Shwe, Bakhtar, all these guys, they learned a reverse swing because, like you said rightly so, because of the pitches, no bounce, no grass, low and slow. You see off the new ball and try to get wickets with the reverse swing deliveries. And, and what are the what are the main skills when you're developing your ability to reverse swing? What are the main skills that you need to work on to to, I think to do that? Nowadays, obviously, it's, it's it's like an open book. When we started doing reverse swing, it was ball tampering, and eventually, <laughs> people got hold of it. It became an art. It became reverse swing. I'm all for it. And I think uh, uh, it depends if you're playing in Sri Lanka, India, or Pakistan. You know, on dry pitches. That's where reverse swing comes in handy. And the whole team kind of has to look after the ball. Yeah. I mean, it means if Tuffer is bowling from one end and I'm bowling from the other end, he can't just roll the ball like this because the rougher side will get soft. And when the rougher side, once it gets soft, it won't reverse. So hence, uh, it's very important for the whole team to look after the ball. And I think England did a great job since 10, 10, 12 years. They bowl really good reverse swing. I mean, Anderson is one of the best bowlers in the world. So is Broad and all these youngsters coming in now. Yeah. Uh, Was do you have to have the right action as a fast bowler to make the ball reverse swing? Or if the ball is reversing, anyone can do it? Uh, anyone can do it, but mostly one swing. If you notice, a lot of bowlers nowadays bowl big in-swingers, very rarely right-hand bowlers. But very rarely you see, uh, apart from Anderson, maybe, maybe Indian bowlers, maybe Pakistani bowlers, Ball, to, to, to take away the ball from the right-hander. But you can practice it. I used to have a re reverse swing ball in my kit bag uh, when I played for Lancashire just to go practice, go around the wicket, go over the wicket, use different angles, close to the stumps, white off the crease. And nowadays, what I see in T20 format, bowlers just run in. They get hammered for sixes and they're running in. Nobody changes their action. Nobody changes their crease. I mean... What, what I learned that my, as a bowler, my job is to create a doubt in batsman's mind. If I'm getting, if it's a slow pitch, if it's a dead pitch in T20 format, just change your run-up, go diagonal, go straighter, go behind the stumps. I mean, bowl the delivery you want to bowl, but create a doubt in batsman's mind. But that's not happening. Well, so you just mentioned bowling in T20 cricket. I think if I'm right, you only played about five matches. Is that right? T20? I think, yes, I played for Hampshire 2003, uh, about three to four games, if I remember, yeah. Uh, I enjoyed it, it was... What, what, um, this is a question, I don't know if you'd like, but Phil probably answer for you. What value do you think you would be as a cricketer in the T20 format now? <laughs> I think you guys can answer more than me. You tell me. I think, you, I, I know you're very rich already, was it? but I think you'd be a lot richer now. <laughs> I think you'd be well into the millions in a lot of these leagues around the world. 
They, I'm rich in rupees, yes, but you guys are well off in pounds. Big difference, mate. <laughs> you, you talk, Waz, you talk about you talk about creating a, a, a doubt in the batsman's mind. Now, I remember facing you at the Oval. All oh, yes, years. I remember. Yes, that's right. And we were doing all right. I think we were about 120 for one. And then the next thing we knew... You know, we were about. I, I was walking in at about a hundred and fifty for, for nine, and um, and I, I didn't see you run up. I, I think Shep. I think Shep was the was the umpire, big old. Exactly, exactly. And he gave me my guard, and the next thing, you just appeared, and and my stumps went all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, uh, from around the wicket, I've learned toughers. If you remember that particular delivery, ninety two at over test. Yes. I used to run behind the umpire. And as a batsman, you could see me at the last second. Absolutely. And if you, if even Michael Warnings, but top batsman is batting, at least he'll have less time to see my reverse swing, which side the shine is, if it's out swing or in swing, it'll be too late for him. Yeah. So these things I've learned, just experimenting in nets, experimenting in games and county cricket guys helped me a lot. I mean, I still have a house in Lancashire from last 30 odd years. I'm quarter Lancastrian. My kids were born here. I love coming here. This is part and parcel of me. But unfortunately, nowadays, in county cricket, you can hire a professional for two weeks. Yeah. So that loyalty factor is not there. Yeah. And why, as you mentioned, um, you know, trying to deceive the batter. In Pakistan, when you were a young kid growing up, were, were you taught that, that you had to kind of do things that just slightly, I mean, in, in England, we've always been very traditional the way that we coach and everything's kind of robotic in a way. But Pakistan have, have, have always produced cricketers that, that are out of the box cricketers, you know, mavericks, just do things differently. Are you kind of encouraged to do that in Pakistan? I think nobody coached me when I was young. I just went to the Nets match at my club. My fast bowling coach was Saud Khan, who was a fast bowler himself. He just said bowl. Just bowl for three hours. And that's what I used to do. Take the ball at 2.30, finish at 5.30 every day when I was 16, 17. And nowadays, I believe... You're allowed to bowl eight deliveries and rest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish they had that when I was playing. <laughs> so, yes, we've been taught to, to think out of the box. Yes, absolutely. We give the, we can, uh, you know, our coaches uh, at even at grass school level uh, uh, sort of said, think yourself. I'm there to help you amend your action. But mentally, you have to make decisions right or wrong yourself and that's how you will learn very quickly and and was him you you were sort of famous for outthinking batsmen and having a plan over a series of deliveries was that something you sort of thought about before the game you knew the uh, batsman's uh, particular weaknesses and strengths or is it something you developed on the hoof as you were to see, as you were as you were bowling against them? i think it's something i developed when our days there was no uh, stat guy there mm. was no person with video clips there was no person with percentage that if warning got out on a cut shot so many percentage bowl him here or bowl him there we just had to think it there and then and and rely on a senior players either it was country cricket or either it was test cricket like Imran, Javed Miyadad, Mundasar Nazar for Pakistan team because as a 17 year old kid my first first class like, game game against New Zealand I, I hardly knew half of the players I only knew Jeff Crow, Martin Crow, Jeremy Coney, Jeff Howard and you know, uh, so I, I've been told just to bowl there, and that's what exactly yeah. I did when I was a young kid. Yeah. I mean, you and you were talking about bowling over and around the wicket. I've had a very enjoyable uh, morning watching your four um, hat tricks, more hat tricks. Ah. Well, you joint, you hold the record for the most international uh, hat tricks. I, t I noticed on the in the one day matches, so you got two one day uh, hat tricks. You're bowling uh, over the wicket or around the wicket and over the wicket for the for the test. Was that just? Did you vary it more between the two different formats? Yeah, I did. I played about almost 370 odd One Day Internationals, and you guys remember our days. Bouncer was a no ball. Yeah. So so many One Days we played, we couldn't uh, we bounce out the batsman because it was just no ball. And yes, I, I think from around the wicket, if it's reversing, especially against the tail ender. It was always easier. You can aim the stumps with the angle. Yeah. I mean, toughers can second me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was like bumping a snake at me. It was like a snake. At me. <laughs> <laughs> because you batted number 11, and by the time you, you came into bat, it was reversing anyway. So no chance for toughers. <laughs> no. no, no. Me and Makar used to grab the ball. Me and Makar used to argue. 
Kafar is walking in. I want a ball. I want a ball. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think everyone used to argue when I came into that, mate. Um, <laughs> you, you, you touched on it there, Wakar. Um, you kind of had this rivalry. That was a good thing for the side, wasn't it? It was. It, it wasn't a jealousy. It was a competitive rivalry. It was one of those mindsets, okay, if Wakar is going to get five wickets, I want to get five wickets in the next innings or the same innings or vice versa. Instead of, uh, you know, being negative, that thinking of a car shouldn't get wickets. So that that helped Pakistan and we had a very healthy uh, relationship. Not in the beginning, but eventually we did, yeah. <laughs> and just, uh, just on other characters, when you won the World Cup in, uh, in the 90s, uh, beating England, uh, did you think at the time that the captain was going to become the president of your country? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I mean, Skipper Imran was the last person as a young kid or as I spent so much time with him uh, uh, in playing days. I would still speak to him once in a while that he'll come into politics. He And after his retirement, I think in 93, 94, he decided he's going to join the politics. And I asked him, I said, Skipper, I still call him Skipper because as you know, Skipper, once a Skipper, always a Skipper. I, I I always, I asked him, I said, why politics? Because you're a shy person, you're well off, you, you know, you can travel the world. And his answer was, when I see average Pakistani struggling, uh, uh, you know, financially or psychologically or health-wise or whatever the reason is, that's the reason I want to join politics. And it was 26 years struggle. And, uh, and then eventually he became the prime minister and he's, I think, a very strong candidate to become the prime minister again, and hopefully in a couple of months. And you mentioned you still have a good relationship with him. Do you, do you, if you, you've obviously got his number, do you ever just ring him up and say, how's it going? I think nowadays it's much easier to WhatsApp. <laughs> Ringing is a bit too much. <laughs> I suppose, I, I, yeah, we do. I, yesterday as I was talking to him. <laughs> oh, I love that. Because... Love, because my book is coming out, so I wanted him to write some forward for it in November. So he, he, he agreed straight away. He said, yeah, tell your ghostwriter to give me a call 10 o'clock at night. And he did. Does, it, <laughs> does he get back to you quite quickly on WhatsApp? Yeah, he does. Well, why do, send him a WhatsApp now Visit. saying, Vaughny and Tuffers say hello <laughs> and just see if he comes back. Let's see if we can get an answer during the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's busy right now, Woody. He's quite busy. What do you think was your best spell of bowling you had, Waz, and why? I think if you talk about one day cricket, like I said, I played so many games, it's difficult to remember one, but straight away comes into mind that World Cup final. Yeah. And especially those two weeks you just mentioned. And mind you, uh, Alan Lamb was the best one-day player in the world at the really? time. And him and Neil Fairbrother were cruising. They were cruising and they both were top one-day players. Yep. And when and after, I think, 34th over, it was a water break. And Imran asked me to come from the pavilion and we need wickets. And there were two balls. And he said, probably the, the other, other uh, pavilion and is reversing a bit. So I said, yeah, sure. And obviously, the first delivery, Neil Fairbrother went to uh, uh, Alan Lamb and told him, Waz will go around the wicket, he'll bowl out swing and make sure you just block it. I think it was one of those days where you exactly, as a bowler, you think you, you think about it and it happened and his, lock stump, his off stump was gone. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you mentioned earlier that you caught, caught a Lancastrian, Waz. You know, you, you spent so many years yeah. at Lancaster in county cricket. What, what, just, just take us back to the 90s in county cricket. What, what was it like? He was like a one big family. I remember when I joined Lancashire in 1988, it was a very alien culture for me. I was 21, 20, 21 year old Pakistani, never lived on my own. They put me in a pub for first three days, some pub on top of, uh, <laughs> on top there was a room. And then they put me in a hotel next to Old Trafford, Trafford Hall Hotel, I think it used to call, is still there or not, I'm not so sure. And everybody was helping me, the team captain, the manager, Alan Omrod, great guy. I became friendly with Neil Faybrother, a club secretary, I think was Rose. Uh, she helped me, she gave me a crockery and then I bought a house. In 1988, and my, my Pakistani accountant, Mr. Sadiq, said, why don't you, he said, I'll help you with your accounts. He was Imran's friend. I said, fine, sure. He said, why don't you buy a house? I said, buy a house? I don't have money. What do you mean buy a house? He said, get a mortgage. I said, what's mortgage? What is mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> so explain everything. 
fortunately I had six year contract with Lancashire. They offered me six years contract. Wow. And that's how I got the mortgage. I kept the house and everybody helped me. It was like a family. Neil Faber used to pick me up. Remember those days you have a car yeah, yeah. and two over two players used to travel together. Either he used to pick me up. He wasn't very comfortable with my driving <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> and they gave, did you say they gave you a set of crockery? As well, crockery, some, you know, cutlery in the beginning, because I didn't, I never owned a house before, buddy. Yeah. How did you, so, how, how did you handle that, Waz? I mean, was that a great sort of growing up period for you? I mean, it must have been a huge sort of shock just to turn up. It, it was a massive kind of, uh, 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 what you call it, uh, a shock maybe, but uh, a pleasant kind of a shock, but it was impossible for me to look after my house and never have lived with the parents. Yeah. Everybody was, everything was done for me. <laughs> yeah. And over here, I had to wash my clothes. I had to, a room attendant, Sprigo was a great guy. He used to wash my kids every morning. And then I got to know where the laundry is. <laughs> then I, and those days there was no GPS or whatever that is. No. I, mean, I got lost every time. <laughs> 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 I got lost on M60 for about two hours one night <laughs> and I had to stop somewhere at a taxi stand and ask the cabbie, can I follow you please? I'll pay you to drop me at my home <laughs> to where I live. <laughs> and you know, the, the, the sense of humor was very different here as well. Yeah. So if you guys remember those days, our kit bags, as you could use them, coffins, they never had st- tires. We used to carry it every time, not, you know, drag it. So, when you're playing as a young kid, you don't go under your kit bag. You just pick your kit. So for one month, I was carrying my bag and I thought, why it's so heavy? There's hardly anything here. And eventually I found out these boys, Paul Alert and Mark Graham Fowler, put a that big brick, <laughs> brick in my kit bag. Put a month. I carried it. <laughs> Where, where do where do well, see so World Cup finals, um, huge test matches, huge one days? Where does the you know the Benson and Hedges Cup finals, the Nat West finals that you played uh, for, for Lancashire in? Where do they rank in terms of great days for you? Oh, uh, right up there, right up there, because uh, people don't understand nowadays. Those days, I remember we the first final we uh, played against uh, Worcestershire. I think it was 1990, maybe, against uh, uh, Hickey was coming in big. It was apparently me versus Hick. So I didn't know the finals. So I didn't know the Lord's atmosphere. And so about weeks before, the new suits tailored, you know, uh, suit for the morning, walk into the ground, suit for the night, after the game, for the dinner, you know. And, and the whole team went on a train with members. It was incredible. And when I arrived in the morning at Lord's, it was 30,000 people. It was something unbelievable something so new and something so exciting for me i don't i don't know if it happens now or not but those days uh, reaching the final at lords was the ultimate yeah what, why was that lancashire side so dominant in though in that period was <laughs> Because of was. Had- <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I think everybody Wani contributed. We had one of the best all rounders at the time, Ian Austin, who bowled well, Bully. batted Bully. well. Neil Fairbrother, Bole, yeah. yes, Neil Fairbrother, one of the best uh, one day players in county circuit and in world eventually. Then we have Chucky. Then we had so many cricketers. In the beginning, it was Warren Hag, Graham Fowler, Paul Allard, Michael Watkinson, and the all rounder. So we had a lot. Of- and Philip De Freitas also was yeah. there. Yeah. So it was my four, five all-rounders bat, we, bat till, we batted till number nine and I think that was the, the, the key of our success every year, every year we won one or two one day uh, uh, finals Was where, where, where is the world game at the minute you know yesterday um, Ben Stokes announced his retirement from 50 over cricket uh, which for me it, it, yeah. it, 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 it's great so when there's a 50 over world cup in a year and a half time and he's announced his retirement because of the, the the schedule, playing so much cricket. All these boards around the world are just fitting in. You know, as soon as they see a week, oh, just put some more cricket in yeah. there. So you can understand what Ben's done, but it's sad for the game, isn't it? It really is. He's such an exciting player. He's one of the best players in world cricket. And imagine him deciding that he's retiring for one day cricket. Quite sad, but I, I agree with him. And even as a commentator now, I commented once in a while, I pick and choose one day cricket is just a drag nowadays, especially after T20. So I can imagine as a player, 
even as a commentator, he doesn't finish. It takes cricket all day, mm. 50 over, 50 over, and then you have to do pre-game, post-game, the lunch game. And you can imagine the players. And then T20 is kind of easier. It's four hours, the game is over. And obviously, the leagues all around the world, there's a lot more money. So, yes, uh, I, I mean, I suppose this is uh, uh, part and parcel of the modern cricket, T20 or test cricket. One day cricket is kind of dying. Yeah, do, yeah. I was just going to say that was. Do, do you see that Ben Stokes's retirement is a bit of a warning for the fifty over game? It really is. I mean, like I said, it's it's quite uh, uh, what you call it. Uh, it's quite tiring for a player to yeah. play one day cricket, and suddenly after T Twenty, one day cricket seems it's going for days, not even a day. So players are focusing on more shorter format as T Twenty. And longer, I mean, format, obviously, test cricket or four-day cricket. Yeah. Which did you before? One-day stuff or, or the test matches? Do you, you, do you... Uh, I always preferred test matches. One day used to be fun, but test matches were where you recognize as a player. Mm. You know, where people still pick you up for the World 11s. Nobody is going to pick you up for the World 11 of T20 after 20 years because there are a lot more players. So that's what I think young players used to think. Okay, money matters. I understand what they, where they're coming from. But they should also, re- also remember if they want to be remembered as one of the greats of the game. Well, do you think it's realistic that in the next few years, the administrators have got to be kind of uh, looking sensibly at maybe Test Match cricket and T20 cricket and we get rid of 50 over cricket? I think so. 50 over cricket uh, is e- e- even it's, it's, it's uh, uh, okay, in England, you have full houses against India. Excellent series just happened. And uh, but in India, Pakistan, uh, India, Pakistan, especially and Sri Lanka and maybe Bangladesh uh, or maybe South Africa in one day cricket, you're not going to fill the stadiums. So yes, back, you know, it's got to be either T20. We have to be very careful. And I think one day cricket is just a rag. No, they're doing it for the sake of doing it. Yeah. You you get you seem to get more sort of dull games, don't you? In ODI, yeah. With the test matches, you've got Especially, you've got the draw to play with. It's the as you say, it's the highest form of the game. Yeah, there's a with battle t- within the battle yes. in test cricket. Yeah. yeah, but in one day cricket, after first ten overs, it's just okay. Uh, just go run a ball, get a boundary, four fielders in, and you get to two hundred, two twenty in forty overs, and never go at last last ten overs, another hundred. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's kind of uh, yeah, run of the mill. <laughs> What do, what do you think of this New England uh, side's approach, Wes? I mean, bas- it's been fantastic ball. summer, hasn't it? <laughs> he hates that, apparently, baseball. He doesn't like that word. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that. I think it's too catchy. The, the, the test matches I have saw against India uh, and against New Zealand, I uh, watched it on and off. I think it was with him coming into this, uh, him as an England coach, that fear of losing has gone out. Okay? He probably said to them, if you lose... I'll take the responsibility. Just go out and express yourself and yeah. play your cricket. Don't go for a draw. Just go for a win. If you lose in a process, I'll support you as a coach. So that's what players wanted to hear. And that's what exactly they did. Not once, not twice, maybe twice they did that in test cricket. Yeah. Uh, incredible. Uh, and well, do, do, do you see Basball having success in Pakistan? And it's so important that England go to Pakistan later in the year for, for yeah. cricket worldwide, but more so for, for Pakistan cricket. Yeah, I think uh, it'll be exciting. T20 format. Just they go. They're playing seven T20s. That's what I've read somewhere. Pakistan, uh, England in Pakistan in September, just before the World Cup. So it'll be good experience. It'll be good practice before the World Cup. And two top teams are competing. And I think it'll be great for Pakistan cricket. The Pakistanis love their cricket. You <coughs> you haven't been there for ages, but if you go, uh, you would see it's a totally different ball game. The country has changed. People love the teams coming in. And it was so unfortunate what happened with New Zealand uh, mm. when they were about to uh, play a game and suddenly some random person mailed to somebody's wife and they said, we're not going to the ground even. It was quite embarrassing for Pakistan. But we, we were over it now. We would love to welcome England. And I think we're all looking forward for England to come. One of the best one-day T20 sides in the world. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Pakistan are ranked three in the world at the moment, I think. How are they shaping up for the uh, world, T20 World Cup? How do you, they, how do you they, that they, they love that format. They enjoy that format. They have so many all-rounders. They're batting at number seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Barber is learning as a skipper. He's getting runs. He just got one of his best hundreds uh, two days ago on a turning track with, and batted with tail ender for about three hours. And uh, he's coming to an age as a skipper as well. So it'll be very interesting. It'll be exciting too. <laughs> 
Whilst what we have on this podcast, we have an eight-year-old girl called Megan. Okay. Who's got into cricket in the last year. Um, she's got a okay. question for you. Hi, Waz. I've seen your videos on YouTube and you make the ball talk. How can I do that? I asked Jai Lil a question about spin last week, but I find that really slow and boring. Your bowling looks way more fun. Megan, I think the only only suggestion I can give you is the more you play, the more you learn. It's, it's, it's difficult to learn swing both ways when you're eight, but eventually you get the hang of it and you'll get there. Practice makes it perfect. Oh, good answer, mate. Good answer. Just one quick thing. Um, you know, wobble seam. We've been talking about yeah. this wobble seam a lot. You, you, that, that is even new to you, isn't it, wobble seam? It is. Never heard of it before, wobbly seam. No. So what happens when the seam wobbles? I don't have a ball. So when, if, if a, say, if Anderson is bowling big outstrings to the right-hander and he wants to bring the ball back in, now he's got control. He goes like this beautifully. He's got beautiful wrist. But, uh, but early on, he also used to wobble because the control wasn't there as much. Yeah. So now the control is there. The bowlers who don't have control uh, with, with, with the other swing, then the natural swing, that's where wobbly seams come in. Yeah, you, it's would, a new word. Thousand, you would have got thousands with wobble seam as well as with uh, the swing. I think I would have got thousands with DRS as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, the DRS kills us, mate. <laughs> I know. Yesterday there was a decision. Umpire said out <laughs> and ball pitched just, uh, you know, outside in between middle and leg and he was clipping. That much clipping oh. leg stem, and it was a biased decision. It was out. Oh. And our days on a front foot, if, you, if you're batting on a front foot, leg before, not out because you're standing two meters outside the crease. That's right. And it's totally changed now, the ball, uh, the cricket tools. And Easier we, for bowlers. And we told them all, we told the umpires that that was hitting and that was out, but they didn't believe They said no. They believed No, they didn't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> was, was, who, who was the best you ever bowled to? Look, I've played against all the greats. I mean, you talk about early 90s, talk about Viv Richards, Sunny Gavaskar, Wing Sarkar, you know, the, uh, Martin Crow, and then you come into 90s, uh, probably miss some Steve or Mark or Brian Lara, Sachin Tendulkar, Rahul Dravid, you know, and uh, uh, all of them. I play, I'm missing quite a few names, maybe Graham Gooch as well, Mike Getting, all these guys. Alex Stewart is one of the top, I think I recommend right up there. Because he used to attack us with the new ball. Yeah. He realized, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not going to hang around with these two <laughs> to wait till the old ball. I'm going to have a go with the new ball. Pull, hook, drive, every delivery. And he got runs against us. If I have to pick one, I think uh, I'll, I'll pick Martin Crow. Oh, right. Wow. Because uh, in 1993, we had a series in Pakistan where Vakar got 30 wickets in three test matches. Obviously, ball started reversing in first three overs. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know why. But, and then I got 16 in two test matches and I got injured the second test. Uh, and and uh, Martin Crowe got 200s. So I asked him after the series, I said, Martin, how come everybody's struggling and you got runs against us? He said, very simple. I used to play you guys on a front foot and in swing. If it's an out swing, it'll go past. I never used to go, you know, follow the ball. In swing, I used to play with a straight back. Block you guys for about half an hour, you'll do something different. You will bounces, you get offline, and that's where I get my opportunity. And that's what he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, he was a fantastic player, wasn't he? He was beauty. He was a beauty. Incredible. Now, the hardest part of the podcast was is when Phil Tufnell um, does his little segment. It's called Either Or. So you've just got to pick one okay. of the two options that he gives you. Phil, are you ready to go? Yes, I've been thinking about these. Okay, the the, the first one is, uh, and you've mentioned it slightly there, uh, Lancashire or Lahore? Lancashire. Oh! <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, that's good. Another one, another tricky one here. Waka or Shoeb? Waka. Waka. Definitely. Definitely. Waka. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Why is because pe these youngsters haven't seen Makar Yunus in, uh, at his prime. <laughs> they can see on YouTube and all, but I saw him standing at mid off every delivery. He just used to sprint in for 30 meters. Oh, and he was mighty quick, boys. Yeah, he was indeed. Uh, another one, Kolkata Knight Riders or Karachi Kings? I think I know the answer to this. I'll definitely go with Karachi Kings. I also had a good time with KKR, but uh, it was just too long for me. I think after four years, 
I just uh, kind of uh, lost interest because two months and every if you working in IPL, great fun, great bunch of lads. My owner Shah Rukh Khan was a great, uh, excellent guy too. But it was just two uh, away two months, and then every every it, in India, I'd travel take a whole day, whole day yeah. travel. Mm. You arrive at the venue, practice straight away, or the game next day, and then travel again. But yeah, Karachi Kings. Okay, and then and then also uh, we well, did say uh, you, you almost answered this new ball or old ball. You went for old ball, so I'm, absolutely. I'm going to come up with a quick one saying that you're, you you've gone for Lancashire um, pie and peas or fish and chips. <laughs> I don't actually uh, like both, but if I have to pick one, I'll go for fish and chips. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Good one. Fantastic, Wasim. Well, that was brilliant. Um, I'm not sure we're allowed to have favourite guests, but I think he was my favourite. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, top, top man, top man, top performer. You know, one of the one of the legends of the game. Yeah, clearly such a lovely guy as well, as as well as being a legendary cricketer. I mean, we throw around the word legend uh, perhaps a little too freely, but he, he genuinely is a legend. Well, I, I reckon, Phil, in the 90s playing county cricket, uh, the first thing you did when you played Lancashire w- was to check that Wasim had arrived. Because, you know, there was one or two times when we played him uh, for Yorkshire in one-day cricket in like the 40 over stuff, and he, he didn't play. But the first thing that you'd do was just check the car park to see if Wasim's car had arrived because you knew if he was there. Well, <laughs> you, were, you were in for an awful day or an awful week yeah. in four-day cricket. He, he once bowled us out at Henley, Phil, in trainers. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> he did. He used to, use, he used to wear Puma Sheffields, didn't he? Puma yeah. Sheffields with no studs on them. He just right. he, he pinned. You couldn't hear him coming. Amazing. I played a game as well. I played a game against Wes for Middlesex. Norman Cowans, I think, bowled Lancashire out for not many. And I think Norman might have got something like six for 15 or something and didn't win man of the match because Wes bowled us <laughs> out for 47. <laughs> uh, but, is that? Six for 15 and you're not ever win. No, he, he was incredible. But I tell you what, again, interesting, you know, from Ravi Shastri saying that bilateral um, one-day T20 series should go to Wazim Akran now saying 50 overs is on the way out. You know, that is, a, again, a, a massive warning sign. Or yeah. a, 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 It's not a warning sign. It's a message to, to the game, really, that 50 over cricket, it, it's dwindling. It, it's on the decline. He, he called it, you know, a long day. You can understand that players are a, a bit bored with it on the back of T20 cricket. He also says that broadcasting and commentating is, is too long a day, Phil, for Wazim yeah. in the 50 over game. But in Pakistan, they do have like a two hour pre show, a two hour post show. It's different to the UK, but Wazim gets bored of commentating in 50 over cricket. <laughs> Listen, when, when Wazim Akram and these guys speak, they're so, um, you know, they're so experienced in the game and that's on and off the field. And as you say, in pundit and commentary roles, people must listen to them. You can't just say, oh, you know, that's just you know, hearsay or whatever. You've got to listen to the legends of the game and take heed. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, he was obviously a legendary one day player. If he's saying that it's dying, I, I, yeah. hope, somebody, I hope people are listening. Maybe they're not. Uh, but talking of Lancashire, uh, the Blast final, oh. they, uh, they obviously <laughs> lost to Hampshire. Uh, for, and, and Hampshire won for a record equaling third time. Um, but what a, what, a, what a finale it was. Lancashire needed four off the last ball. They were changing 152 <laughs> for eight. Uh, and then Nathan Ellis bowled Richard Gleeson. They all went berserk running around the pitch. <laughs> uh, only for him to be no bald. I know it was amazing. They'd, they'd all the fireworks had the gone. The fireworks off. went off. <laughs> <laughs> the stumps had been pulled out. There was pieces in cattle in the champagne had popped, and I think it was Bumble's boy. And you just saw a picture of Bumble's boy who was umpiring going. Lads, you've got to come back. You've yeah. got to come back. It's an old ball. And then when they when they finally did win it, there was just like three fireworks that went off. <laughs> <laughs> it just went poof. Yeah, premature, premature celebration. It was. Well, but it was I, a great game. And, I think, and, and that Nathan Ellis, he's, he, he's fantastic bowler at the death. Yeah, yeah, he, he's high class. Like the, the Yorkers, the back of the hand, slow balls. Um, I have to say Lancashire should have pissed that game. 
they they were controlled. It was a run of run of a ball, I think, with eight wickets remaining. They should have strolled that game. And you know, for Hampshire, Hampshire are, are, are quite a cool team in T Twenty cricket. I think James Vince's captaincy was outstanding. The way that he manoeuvred that bowling attack, and the way that he put the fielders in the right place, the way that he kept his cool at the end. Um, James Vince was high, high class as a leader. Ellis is a death bowler. Vince is a, a captain leader. Uh, high class, great day. The Vitality Blast this year, I tell you what, the 100 has got a lot to uh, kind of live up to because the 100's got all the promo. It's got kind of the the kind of new cool behind it. There's a lot of new fans that went to watch it last year. Um, but the Vitality Blast this year has delivered a great, great product. Finals Day proved it. The overseas players for most of the teams have been exceptional. Um, so the 100, Phil, has got a little bit to uh, live up to in the next few weeks. No, no, ab- ab- absolutely. Um, I mean, there's some fresh faces coming into the 100 as well, which I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it was a fantastic look finale, wasn't it, to the T20 Blast? And it's funny, that that, ha- that Hampshire side, they just know how to get over the line, don't they? They've done it three or four times from, from low scores. And, um, yeah, very well led by James Vince. And, um, yeah, I was laughing my head off when they said no ball. It was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not funny to live through it i mean your emotions must have been a roller coaster <laughs> oh yeah yeah i don't know how players deal with that these days it's a completely different era but what about lanky the giraffe <laughs> he had a long day in the heat in the outfit oh. he, he, fe- he, he yeah, fell on the, yeah. the, the the mascot race he, he fell he stumbled over the line and then he's, he's out there all night dancing yeah. and his team lose a thriller <laughs> He got his head caught in the netting, didn't he? He got his head caught. He couldn't get through the netting. He was devastated. Well, I think that's the only plus is was before the temperatures really took off, because otherwise I think he might have suffered a heat stroke as well. <laughs> right, the covers are coming on. That's all we've got time for today. A big thank you to Mike and Phil. I hope you enjoy your rides on the Big Banana. A huge thanks to Wazim Akram and to Ravi Shastri. As I said, we'll be hearing more from Ravi in the coming weeks. The three of us are back next Wednesday, same time, same place. Until then, you can catch up on past episodes, including a fascinating chat with Indian spinner Ravi Ashwin last week. That episode and more are all available on the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club channel, wherever it is you download your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and please do subscribe to ensure you don't miss future episodes. Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>